Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pilton Palais and this t evening screening of Eno. Um, we're going to start with a little Q&A because I'm delighted to say we have the director of the movie, Gary Hustwit, with us. Please welcome Gary. <laughs> Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming. Hi. Hi. So you are extremely privileged tonight because you are about to see a film that no one else in history has seen, including its director, and that no one else in history will ever see again. Isn't that right? That is right. It is a unique version of the film <clears throat> um, made just for you here in the, in the room. So. Yeah. so tell us about this. This is, a, this is not AI, this is not ChatGPT making your film but it is a computer process. Yeah, it's a generative um, software system that we designed to do a very specific thing, which is to make a film that's different every time it screens. Um, it's very organic to what Brian Eno's uh, process is, of course, legendary musician and um, artist uh, who has used generative software in his music making for, for decades now. And um, he didn't want to be in a conventional documentary that was some person's version of his story. Um, and I also wanted to make a film that, that could change, that was more like music, that was performative, um, that, that when I saw it, um, I could be surprised just like the audience was surprised. <laughs> Um, so we started working um, on this project uh, with a, a digital artist and coder named Brendan Dawes, who's amazing. And um, yeah, we while we were doing the filmmaking and talking with Brian, we were also developing this software system. And um, yeah, the result I think is something that is it's a different approach to making films. It's a different approach to watching films. And um, I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities that can kind of spin out of this technology. So just to kind of clarify how this works, because you may all understand this, I needed some help. But you and a human editor have a human editing team, I guess. Team. Team. More editors than any other film that I've, that I've worked on. So you have put together sort of packages or scenes or moments uh, that you think are important or good or say something about Brian Eno. Yeah, there's, we've put together um, raw footage, uh, edited scenes, archival footage, just a, a whole um, you know, body of material that the software system can pull from and in make a different um, order. Sometimes there's different scenes, there's different music. Um, the software, you'll kind of see it while the movie is uh, playing because you see it looking for um, uh, looking through the data set and looking what scenes and footage it could play next and you see the names of some of these scenes on the screen and we kind of built that into the visual aesthetic of the film so um, yeah so it's kind of making the film um, dynamically it's creating transitions it's creating scenes from raw footage it's doing all this stuff but somehow it kind of makes sense <laughs> it's not a random uh, mashup of, of, uh, of, of, of footage it's um, has kind of an arc and a narrative to it. Because you, you have created, like, is it probabilities that, you know, some scenes make more, might make more sense in this quadrant or the, the film, and some scenes might make more sense? Is, yeah. is that how it works? There's lots of different ways that, that we do it. Um, what, one thing is that it's all about one person. So if you learn about, um, you know, working with Bowie, you, you can learn that at 20 minutes or 40 minutes, or in, in some ways, it, 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 you'll still kind of figure out the story by the end of the, the film. Um, and a lot of times, it's uh, Brian talks about it in the film that you're about to see, our brains are kind of designed to look for patterns, and we want to see connections, and we're constantly, um, you know, trying to do that. And sometimes there might not be a connection, but you'll kind of find one somehow. So each time you watch the film, every individual viewer kind of makes their own connections through the story and, and makes the story themselves in some way. So it's part software, but it's also part um, the way our brains work. Yeah. I have to say, so I saw this for the first time in the Barbican a few months ago. You did a Q&A with Brian afterwards. Um, and in that version, there was a scene at the Barbican. So we were talking about this backstage, but that wasn't intentional. That, <laughs> that wasn't, wasn't something you, you set up. You didn't kind of tell the computer, this is going to be Put at the Barbican. the Barbican scene, no. Yeah. But, that, but there, that scene has a, probably a high probability of coming, of coming up. Um, but there were a ton of scenes that didn't come up yeah. that uh, you know, are 
think are going to be in this version. So um, yeah, it, it's there are scenes that I love and that I, I'm kind of rooting for to come up, and then they don't come up, and I'm like, oh, it's kind of disappointing. But that's also part of this whole experiment. Um, it's not my version of what the best story is, um, because that might be different than you. You might think of a different story you want to see. So um, we let the software kind of do its thing. And um, as a filmmaker, I kind of have to be OK with the results of it. It's, it's a different approach. It's not my normal. You know, normally filmmakers and editors were control freaks. We want to see every moment of the footage and craft every piece of it. And this, we're kind of, um, you know, rolling the dice a little bit and kind of accepting that loss of, uh, of control. So, how much is there for the film to choose from? And can it, can you keep adding to it? Can you keep yeah, going? Yeah, there's just hours and hours and hours of footage. I've kind of lost track. We keep adding <laughs> new things to it every week that we wow. find. Um, I mean, Brian had 500 hours of footage in his archive that we, and then all the new shooting that we did too. So um, there's, uh, there's so much that we haven't even really gotten to yet, but if we find something that's interesting and we're like, oh, this is great, let's, let's put it in. You put it into the, to the system and maybe it comes up tonight. Maybe you'll have to watch 10 more times to see that David Byrne thing that we just did. So it's, um, it's a, again, it's a different approach, but, um, but I think it's, it's, it's fun, like why do films have to be the same every time we watch them? It's just like a, you know, it's 130 years we've been making movies kind of in the same way. And we think of them as these, you know, they're these fixed linear things, they're never gonna change. We go back to films that we love because we love that story and we love that world around that story. But what if that world and that story could kind of change a little bit? What, what if it could evolve? And, you know, a year later, you watch the film that you love again, and maybe something is a little bit different, and you got to kind of figure out what it is. Um, I, I like the idea that the films can have a little bit of a life of their own and, and can evolve over time. And we have the technology to try this stuff now, so why not, why not try it? Well, that's something I wanted to ask you about. I mean, how, how wide do you think the applications of this could be? Because it's, it's so suited to Brian, certainly. So do you see a lot of other documentary subjects that could be a fit? Do you think it could work for sure. features? Like, what? Yeah, well, I, I've gotten a lot of people contacting me about with all kinds of projects, documentary projects, but also fiction films, too. I mean, if you can think about all the alternate takes that get shot of every scene of a, of a narrative film, um, and if you kind of put all of those in, you weren't really sure which one was going to come up. You could switch points of view of different characters throughout a story. Um, stories that are about, um, that have that kind of like mixed up chronology or, you know, like uh, any um, Christopher Nolan film basically could be a generative film or any, um, you know. There's so many filmmakers, I think, that are already have been experimenting with nonlinearity and messing with chronology anyway, but now it can actually, like, they can actually do those things um, instead of just having to kind of settle on one, one version of it. Um, just a kind of traditional documentary question for a minute. I mean, tell me about, you know, your first meetings with Brian. Like, what, was there anything he didn't want to talk about that he, he was like, oh, I'm not sure I want to get into that? Was there, were there well, things that he was kind of hesitant about at first? Yeah, he, he, I mean, he's been doing this, you know, since the 70s, getting interviewed. And, you know, uh, usually people always want to talk about Bowie. They want to talk about Roxy Music. They want to talk about Talking Heads, kind of the same questions over and over again. And Brian is very much about the future. He doesn't want to think about the past. He wants to keep pushing and keep innovating. So it, it's really, um, he just gets really annoyed if you if you go up and ask him about, about Bowie in Berlin or Heroes or whatever. But, um, but, you know, I wanted to really talk with him about creativity. That was my goal. I like, I love the music, but um, I think there's so many creative uh, lessons that Brian has and strategies and all these different approaches. That's what fascinated me. Like my, my background in filmmaking is doing design films and I'm always looking at the creative process and, and trying to kind of decode it. So, um, so if you focus on creativity, Brian will all, uh, eventually get back to Bowie and the other things that he's done. But you kind of have to, you know, yeah, just to like go in and, and, and have a great conversation. I mean, we talked for hours and hours and hours about, about anything he wanted to talk about. And that's the other thing I love to do. Like, I don't go into interviews with a list of questions. I, I just kind of go in and, and it's a conversation, you know, and, and let, let uh, we can ramble, we can talk about anything. It's about um, 
getting the subject into the right frame of mind to then really think creatively and, and be having fun, having, you know, have, forget that they're being interviewed. That's, that's the goal, so. Um, I will take, if any of you have a question, by the way, I will come to you in a minute, so have a think for a second. But I want to ask you, first of all, um, I mean, we, we have, weirdly, I'm not there uh, showing tomorrow, which is about you know the, yeah. the, all these different people. I don't know if you've all seen it, but all these different people playing aspects of Bob Dylan. It feels a very similar idea. It could this. be a generative film. We could yeah. do a generative version of I'm Not There that would scramble that chronology yeah. every time you watched it. Yeah. Or maybe there's other scenes that they didn't use that could be in there. That's but great. It, I got to call uh, Todd Haynes. <laughs> <laughs> but it does feel like a similar idea. Like if you have someone who is so creative, who has worked in so many different fields, different genres, different ideas through their whole life, why would you lock them into one Sure. Period? And also, why would you lock storytelling in general into some sort of chronological uh, or some sort of rigid narrated storyline or something like that? I like films where you have to kind of make your own story. You're given information as the viewer, and you put the pieces together. Um, that's much more engaging, I think, than having someone tell you what the story is and sort of cram it down your throat. Um, I want to make those discoveries when I'm watching a film. And yeah, something like I'm Not There is a perfect example. You, you, you make the connections. Sometimes there are no connections, but it's all Dylan in weird different ways. So um, the conceit of the film and the structure of it uh, allow you as the viewer to bring more into it than a traditional biopic or whatever. All right, do we have any questions out there? Yes. You and the black. So we have a we have a mic coming your way, so we'll be able to hear you all over all of this. Okay, thank you. Um, at what point is the are the oh, are the decisions made as to what's shown, and is there any element of feedback for future showing? Literally feedback. You had to say feedback. Wow. <laughs> Did I say feedback? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, again, it's based on a, a lot of, um, of programming of the algorithms that, that choose the, the scenes and sequence them. Pardon? Are the decisions made now? The decisions are made every time we, we output a version of the film. Oh, so, okay, so that was done yesterday or the day Exactly, before, exactly. Okay. So each time the system does it, we can also create it live in the moment, but the system will also render out a file that has, you know, a complete film. If I click generate, it'll, it'll make the movie and I can click it again and it'll make it a different way. So, um, so it's making those decisions. Um, the feedback, uh, we can do it so that we could skew it any way we wanted to. More music, less music, more talking, early Brian, later Brian. You, you can do anything you, you want. Um, I tend to not try to uh, impose uh, anything like that on it. Again, I, I'm kind of going for the, the idea of like, can we make it uh, feel like a, a, a complete documentary every time? Uh, and you really kind of come away like you've learned something from him and about him. Even if the pieces are different, you still kind of get that feeling. And the next time you see it, you're going to get another layer of knowledge about him and an inspiration and so on. Okay. So um, there are, in this, I mean, this is the first generative film, the first generative feature film made. So um, we're experimenting. We keep modifying and revising things. And we keep adding more footage. We keep tweaking stuff that we're, we're seeing when we're showing it in places. So um, yeah, it's an ongoing, it's an uh, ongoing so, process. So you're supplying some of the feedback in terms of your, yes, definitely, your definitely. appreciation, well, understanding of what happened in a previous one. Exactly, okay. exactly. Because I've seen every, I've seen now it's 32 screenings, um, public screenings where I've watched every second of the, of the film. So. Um, but I couldn't do that if it was just the same film every time. No, I would no, have of course not. shot myself um, <laughs> months ago. Because you can't watch the same thing over and over and over again that many times. But since it's always changing and I'm learning new things every time, even I am learning things when I see it. Because I might not have seen the, some two different scenes together. And then I'll just go, oh my god, he was talking about that in 85. And then you see the connections. You see his thinking evolving over time. So even though I've seen, you know, 
I don't know how many hours now of, of it. Um, I, I still uh, am excited to watch it. Okay, thank you. We, we should say it's about the same length every time, right? Roughly? It's always different, but it's this generation is around 85 to 90 minutes. Um, but every single every single screening of the film is a slightly different length. <laughs> but it always ends up somewhere around there. Amazing. Any other final questions? Yeah, we've got, okay, we've got two more questions, and then I'm going to have to wrap it up. <laughs> then we can watch it. Hi, uh, um, this is going to be my first time seeing the film. I'm very much looking forward to it. I've got some friends though who have seen it multiple times at film festivals or in London, and um, have told me that it's really rewarding having seen it multiple times and how much you can get out of it. I was wondering, is the technology there for it to ever enter streaming or to be viewed online or anything like that? And if not, do you think the industry is going to have to catch up to start being able to, yeah. to, to feature that's, films like yours? Like that's yours? a great, a great question. Um, we, we do uh, obviously want to stream it. it. It would be amazing that every viewer got a, a unique version of the film that they streamed. Um, the big streaming networks now don't have that technology. Um, we are talking with some of them. We are kind of working on dynamic streaming um, solutions so that we, we want to get to that, to that point. Um, there are other ideas too. You could just, the Eno movie could just be on 24 hours a day, just making itself and remaking itself. And, you know, at night it's all quiet and ambient, and then in the morning it picks up again. And um, there are a lot of different ways to do it. But um, I think that, you know, streaming now is just, it's one kind of dumb file that's pushed out to millions of people. Um, there's no variation in the creation side of that um, equation. So this idea that you could have films change and, and that everything we watch on streaming is made in real time for us, according to whatever you know, parameters, things that we want to see, things that you know, um, things we've watched before or whatever. I think that idea, that capability to personalize or to change or to kind of evolve films is something that that streaming kind of needs um, I like real I'm a documentary filmmaker I like real footage I like to film people but I like the the opportunities and the possibilities that generative technology offers from a structural and storytelling point of view there's just so many things we can do you know it's not about like creating fake you know synthetic video um, it's about using the software to do things with the film structure that we could never do before. So this is a capability that filmmakers didn't have. Now that it's kind of, you know, we have it, now is when I think it's interesting because there are other people who have uh, maybe better ideas than I do about what to do with it and getting them involved in, that, in this process and getting those ideas and making more generative films, I think that's, um, that's what's exciting for the future. And it's, you know, it's not gonna, linear films are not gonna be dead. We're still gonna be making linear films. But this is an interesting path and, I, and I'm, I'm kind of excited about following it. Thank okay, you. we have time for one more question. So the lady with the hat, who's behind that guy? I think lady, I apologize if I'm being wildly misgendering people. <laughs> I think actually you, you kind of already answered my question. It was it was actually quite similar, but um, I wanted to sort of follow up on that because you were talking in, in, initially about you know we would see this and it would be the only time that we got to see this particular version. So at some point, would this go into a creative process where we would be able to see every version and the evolution of it, or if it does go to a streaming, is something lost in the fact that? You know, it's it's no longer unique if we do see every version. Which which way is the way you'd want to go? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's all new. I mean, we're 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 experimenting and discovering new um, ideas and new ways to present this film every day. So um, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I think it, it is interesting to think that the version six months from now will be very different from tonight. Yeah. Um, and you know maybe there is something lost from that you know not being able to see tonight's version in the future. Um, I'm not I'm not sure, uh, but uh, but but again it's going to be I think fascinating to kind of find out and and uh, and and again experiment with this idea and play with this idea more. So you haven't been disappointed by any versions so far? No, they're all good because they're all about Brian, and I think Brian's pretty fascinating. So. Um, 
sometimes they have a little bit different mood, but um, you, you learn something and hopefully will be inspired by every version, including this one. Well, can confirm based on my two viewings anyway. But listen, <laughs> thank you very much for your questions, everybody. And thank you to Gary Huswitz. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoy Everybody it. enjoy Cheers. Eno.